Yeah, okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm Jan Lübbe from Pangotronics, and I'm one of the two main developers of RAUC, but that should be the topic here because I want to talk about update tools for embedded systems in general. And not just I want to talk, I want to hear from you, and I hope we uh, can start a nice discussion about the yeah, topics that have not been solved by the existing tools. So, uh, yeah, the existing tools are updating tools which should be able to update the root file system, application, whatever that may be on our embedded systems. Obviously, the kernel, device tree, maybe an init RAMFS, possibly the bootloader, because even in the field, we might find problems in the bootloader and have to update that. Uh, some systems can do that, others don't. Uh, probably also depends on the hardware and additional components like firmware for FPGA, CPLDs, or microcontrollers on, on our boards. So um, what are the basic features all the different uh, tools out there already support? It's fail safe upgrade. So if the system crashes or anything goes wrong during the update, the system shouldn't be uh, damaged. You should be able to roll back. So if you boot into the new system and then decide you like the old one better, you should be able to uh, switch to the old system again. We won't have signatures on our updates because uh, there's uh, dangerous internet out there. So we want to make sure that the updates that are installed are actually produced by us. Compatibility checks to make sure that we don't install the wrong update on the system and brick it that way, even if it might be signed by the correct person. Um, online and update, uh, offline updates are basically, you, you have the update system download the update over the internet, but there are also systems out there which have no or very little internet connectivity and you have a technician who goes there with a USB stick or something like that and installs an update. So uh, the, the existing tools support workflows like that. Then we need some build system integration. So what have you, Yocto, build root, PTX test, whatever, builds a, an update image that should be e easy and uh, sh shouldn't be something you need to build yourself. And in the simplest case, we want to have an AB mechanism to switch between two systems to get this fail safe and rollback update. There are some Additional features which not all of these systems have or not in an extent which I would call a finished or complete. Um, for example, encryption of update artifacts at rest. So you can trans uh, transport a USB stick with an update image to the system and if it gets lost, nobody has access to the um, application data which is in, in the update. Then you have the question where to store that key to decrypt the update, which is not easy to answer. And also uh, the topic of delta updates, some of these tools uh, support it, others don't. Depends on the use case if that's interesting. So uh, what have we as open source tools to do updates? In that sense, there's uh, SW update by Stefano Babic from Denks. Uh, which has been around a few years. There is uh, Menda or Menda.io, which also includes an update server. It's more focused on, on the online update side of things. Uh, there's Rauk, which I started with a colleague of mine. Uh, has also been around a few years. And several others. Um, at the end of the slides, I have a list and some comparisons done by other people. But we shouldn't focus on the individual tools, at least in the beginning. And there are also Firebase tools compared to the image-based tools I mentioned before. For example, OS tree, which was started, I think, by some of the GNOME people who basically treat a complete system like a Git repository so you can check in new versions, transmit them over the net, and install them on others and switch between different revisions on the same system. And there's also SWUPD from Intel. Uh, I think it's used by Clear Linux, which groups different features into bundles that can be installed in a file system. So it's 
more like OS3 in that regard. So uh, I said I don't want to focus on specific tools because then we wouldn't get to the interesting topics which have not been solved. So um, for, this, for the discussion, please talk about generic topics. Um, and I'd like to focus on image-based updates or complete file system-based updates, not on systems like uh, Debian or RPM or OPKG-based updates, because in our experience, uh, doing updates on a package level is very difficult to test because you have so many combinations, things that can go wrong, and it's easier to test uh, a defined state of the system and then deploy that into the field. So I'd like to focus on, on full system updates. And there are also updater tools like uh, Resin IO, for example, which are mainly a mechanism to deploy applications in containers on embedded systems. So that doesn't cover how to update the base system itself, how to update the bootloader. So in some cases that's interesting, but there are different tools and uh, yeah, different topics to solve there. So basically what I'm looking for are war stories, people who have used those tools, good experiences, bad experiences, missing features where we should spend our efforts next, unsolved problems. So maybe to get feeling for the audience, uh, how many of you have developed systems with such field update tools and deployed them already. So maybe half. Um, how many of you are planning to do that and don't have that? Uh, maybe a third. Okay. So at least from half of you, I expect some uh, answers. So. Um, I've prepared an Etherpad. Uh, probably most of you know how that works. It's a uh, document you can uh, add it interactively. So you have the link here. Uh, you can open that on your laptops. It's readable. Open that again. So basically what I said already is in that uh, document, I'll write it here again. So, and I've prepared some topics which I think might be interesting uh, to discuss here, but I actually don't know, so I want to First collect some additional topics and then do a poll which we should discuss first. So that most people uh, find some interesting topics here. So we have two microphones in the front. So please, if you have something to say, come up to the microphone. So in addition to the, to the topics we have here, uh, do you have any additional topics we should put on the list, put up to a vote? Just, just come up to the microphone. Uh, I have it under uh, related software. So no, no additional topics. Um, Or is there more interest in, in, in discussing the, the basic stuff I uh, mentioned under uh, soft tools? Okay, then let's just go over the, uh, sorry, sure. Yeah, hello, hello, is it on? Okay. okay, I will be really loud now. <laughs> um, uh, what's interesting for me is how to uh, segment for your users. Just imagine you have kind of a test set up in your lab and you want to deploy a test to this test setup 
then you have your Asian market, your US market, and so on, and you want to deploy specifically for these markets something like that I'm interested in. If there's this existing, how can I distinguish and how can I target my users and my other users? An additional topic? Otherwise, yeah. J just come up to the microphone. <laughs> Any additional ones? Both, both should work. I know it is complicated to get that right, but I was wondering about uh, the encryption of uh, the, the update. So uh, I know that the, uh, I think, um, uh, the key will be able, is complicated to put somewhere, but so that would be one question. Yeah. yeah. Internet is broken. So, and some people are writing um, binary diffs, delta updates for bandwidth constraint devices, and hybrid setups for mixed requirements, reliable system partition, and something else. Okay. Okay. Um, could we get a fixed battery for that one? Okay. Uh, so, my question is how to. Uh, in the case, if you cannot do A, B updates, if you just can't, you don't have the capacity, uh, what can you do to mitigate the risks? Okay. So, um, yeah, let's go through them, uh, collect how many people are interested in discussing them, and just pick the maybe three or four most interested uh, topics. So, um, how to target different markets and environments? Who's interested in that? Five, six people? So. Oh. Um, encrypted updates. Ten. Alternatives for AB uh, systems, for resource constraint systems, 20. How to detect a successful update? 20 again. Migration of user data. 25. Generic discussion about missing features in the existing tools. Three, automated testing of the update uh, process itself. 15, base system independent or versus the application update. Eight, signing with a hardware security module or crypto tokens. Three. Benefits of uh, uh, benefits versus complexity of multiple signatures. So uh, systems which require many uh, signatures before the update can be installed, like the update framework. Six. Data updates. Fifteen. Uh, that's basically yeah. Uh, I'd say that that's the same as binary uh, diffs. Updating secondary systems or processors, 10. Peer-to-peer -peer update distribution, so if you have a network of many systems which is connected to the uh, internet slowly, 2. Atomic bootloader updates, 
15. Hybrid setups, uh, reliable system partitions, and partition for user applications. I would say that's the same as um, base system versus application updates. Common format for images with a manifest for signature and dependencies. One. <laughs> and ease of supporting a new bootloader. One as well. So, what have we? Um, okay. Let's say migration of user data, 25. And, yeah, basically, let's start with that. So, um, maybe I can start with what we've been doing f for that for our customers. Basically, they all have AB systems where the root file system and the application is stored, but that's read-only. So for the application data, for configuration data like um, IP addresses uh, used on the network interfaces and so on, those cannot be stored in the root file system. So the obvious solution is to use some third partition for this data. Um, but then you have the question, what happens if you need to change the format of that data in an update? So there are basically a uh, few different approaches you can do there. Just define a format with something like JSON where you can addi add additional uh, properties where the old system won't be confused on a rollback. But you might lo lose the data if, it, uh, if the configuration data is written again. Um, another approach is to have two data partitions, which is basically copied on an update to the currently inactive one, and the new system then does some data migration, like a database migration script or something like that. The advantage is that the, you can do real migrations of the schema, but when you fall back, you are running with old data. So you need to have some way in the application to maybe switch off or disable booting the old system completely. So, yeah, I'd be interested in how problems like this have been solved by other people. So, have they, they been solved? Good experiences, bad experiences? Nobody? I didn't expect that uh, I would be a solo entertainer here. <laughs> so uh, please come up to the microphone and relate your experiences. Well, I actually have more a question. So how, how do you deal for like things which are general open source tools or libraries which need some config file in slash etc. So do you consider slash etc being data always or is that part of the root file system or how do you deal with that? I think for the user kind of application it's quite clear. The user must make sure that on an update his application can still read the old configuration or the application should just kind of, yeah, migrate it but for the rest, for root file systems, or for things which you don't control, it's a bit harder. Yeah. Um, from my experience, uh, it's mostly uh, the, the configuration of yeah, system utilities like SSH or Network Manager or Host APD or something like that are pretty static. And in many cases, it's enough to do some templating from data in the configuration partition. So on boot up, you read maybe the IP address or Wi-Fi SSID and password from the data partition, generate configuration files at runtime in an overlay file system or something like that, and then start the services. The benefit of that is that if you move to a new um, SSH version where you need to modify other things which are not stored in, in the uh, configuration or not modifiable by the user. Then you just change your template and the template is also contained in the root file system so it 
you always can generate a matching configuration to the uh, yeah, updated software. And you can also comp uh, copy complete configurations in your data partition and copy them back on startup. Okay. But then you have some kind of ABI between the application and those templates. That thing you kind of replace there or match yeah. that. Yeah, okay. But that's, I guess that's fine. Yeah, then there's um, some tools which yeah, have uh, schema to generate configuration files from yeah, declarative descriptions in JSON or something like that. Um, Augeas Lenses, I think, uh, if you Google that, that might be something to try. But in most cases, we didn't need, need the complexity, just templating off static values into uh, configuration files for our standard open source services. So um, maybe to give also some feedback to your question. So this is essentially also what we are using for our application. So um, on the one hand, we, um, yeah, we didn't, also mainly we didn't want to integrate the knowledge how to write these um, configuration files into our application. So our application um, writes its own um, little uh, yeah, database. So it's just text value, um, 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 key value database. And then we have a, um, um, a small little application that bundles that know-how based really for that let's say distribution currently in there um, to generate um, the configuration files. So for what, um, and we only do that when we shut down the system because like by design for our application, it is desired that the user does changes and then they only um, are activated once the system is rebooted. And um, maybe also in regards of um, um, the topic you had in regards of user data, um, so, yeah, we came to the conclusion that um, because uh, our, the configuration of our comp um, application is really, really complex, so we really made the decision to, um, when you install, we, we store the user data in a separate partition, so if you install an update which is compatible to th that user data, it will continue to use that. If it's not compatible, it intentionally falls back to a default configuration. And um, on top of that um, is that um, we then still retain these old configurations as long as possible. So we have like, um, like three slots for configurations. And if the user then decides to, um, let's say, installs an update, thinks, ah, maybe not what I wanted, goes back, he still has like the last two configurations he can go back. That also works if you go back to uh, old software version. Yes. Okay. So it's it's, it's really like like a whatever uh, like like caching the old versions and um, yeah, not throwing them away immediately. How how do you check if that uh, configuration is still compatible to the new software? Is that something your updater to, uh, tool does? Okay, that that is then um, really a manual step the user has to do. So there's a, like an external configuration program where you can see, okay, what is in the other slots and say, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, based on date and some version information, okay, that's where I want to go back to as well. So um, also to roll that, so this is, fits, I would say, in, in the image in, um, for our application, also the um, updates. Um, we have an um, external configuration tool and you use that tool for um, um, downloading updates to the system as well as selecting um, uh, with, with which configuration do you want to run to. So it's really like a configuration tool. Is there something you would need from an uh, open source updating tool to handle these workflows? Are you um, using one? Yes, we are using um, the, from Stefano the software update. And um, so we are using that in a way that we have a um, proprietary USB protocol for going from a Windows PC mm. to the embedded Linux system, and um, then the data is um, really pushed block by block into a software update, and then everything goes normal. So, but no, so theoretically, yes, we could do also with a software update like um, over the air updates and all that fancy stuff, but 
uh, in our ap application for regulatory purposes, uh, it's that, that is anyhow not allowed. You, you have to be at the system when you do the update. So thus, this is good for us. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, about the topics stated, uh, the, the user data migrations, uh, if one, in one of our products we use the strategy of moving almost all of the user data to the cloud. So we only store like a token and the net network settings uh, on the device to connect to the internet. And then the device, if it is not sure what to do or what the, the configuration is, it can just always go to the cloud and check what's the actual configuration uh, that the user has set up on that. Uh, I understand that this, this uh, approach is quite limited uh, based on the device purposes, but looks, uh, but it works for us. And I don't know, maybe if the, your device is like hardly connected, I mean, not hardly, but definitely connected to the internet, you can use that. Uh, and as a fallback, you can always run user migrations uh, on the cloud backend and all that. So how's it going for you? Um, do you have a, a way to identify the uh, individual devices? So. Uh, yes, uh, each device has a user token uh, that serves as a cryptographically uh, proved uh, access token to the backend, and it has per device ID. We use these IDs to track them in the software updates also, so we can just distinguish uh, device A from device B. So maybe that helps a lot with the solution. But um, I'm probably the issue, as, as I can see, is that in the case of uh, backend outage, we have only a, a local cache of the configuration, and the user cannot access the configuration, and that's the greatest limitation of this uh, approach, as far as I can see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we've got a uh, AV system with a um, user partition of the type you described, and in, in our case, we, um, you know, after an upgrade, the first thing that's run when a, a new version starts, it runs a migration script which updates the user data if there's been any change in config. But the, the, the main issue with that is, of course, it prevents rollback effectively, and that's something we haven't we haven't uh, we'd like to get to in the future. I think the other one of the other topics you've got about is detecting a successful upgrade, and obviously, if we were to do that, we'd need a way of rolling back. And if mm. you've only got a one-way migration script, that kind of prevents that. So, you know. Typically, the actual content of any migration is very minor modifications to only a very small number of files. So I guess it would be good, and I don't know of any tools for doing this, but it would have something that would just take a snapshot of the file of the user changes before you apply the migration, um, and then so that you could roll them back afterwards. I, but I don't know of any tools that do Yeah, it, you but can I'm, basically store metadata with the snapshot yeah. for which older version That's of the right. software this configuration applies. So I think that's probably the way we, we want to go, but we haven't, we haven't quite got there yet. Do, do we have uh, actual problems with that happening in the field? That it hasn't happened right? yet. So far, we've not had to roll back. But, okay. but I mean, it, in order to make the system more robust, it would be preferable if, if rollback roll back was available. Yeah. Okay. So maybe just one more comment, and then I think we need to go to the next topic. Um, we are using kind of, uh, we have an AB system with a data partition and um, using combination of overlay FS for uh, configurations like um, network addresses and network configuration. And on the other hand, our application updates uh, the database on startup. That's how we do it. So, and you're not doing rollbacks on, on that user data? Uh, we didn't have to right now, and um, there's also le um, not that many um, right now. But we have to check later if, if there's some, uh, something we need to do there to do rollbacks on that. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks. So the next topic would be this one. So, alternatives for the two AB systems. Um, in general, I, I like AB best because it keeps the system simple. You don't have a specific role for each slot. But what we've done and 
that's supported by Rauk and I think also by SW Update is that you have um, a smaller rescue system which usually doesn't contain the application. Maybe just a kernel appended in a drum file system which contains maybe a web interface and the updater. So that can be as small as a few megabytes. And then you can basically, if the main system fails to start, you fall back to the updater system. And uh, from there, the user can install an update to recover the system. The main uh, disadvantage is obviously that to install an update, you must first reboot into the rescue system, disrupt the normal running application, and then reboot again to switch back. And rollback is harder because you don't have the old copy anymore. But yeah, that's usually how we do it if we have to because the, the storage space is too small. But that's, with, with EMMCs, um, the problem doesn't happen that, uh, that often anymore because you have four gigabytes or eight gigabytes of EMMC and then it's easy to, to have AB systems. Any more comments to that, or did I cover that completely? Um, another interesting alternative, if you have many systems in a local network and some other controlling system in there, an alternative might be to have the rescue system just boot over network. If you have enough control over your bootloader, then you just have an A system on the device itself, and if that fails to boot, you go back, boot TFTP from the uh, controlling server, and that one can then recover the system. That's more flexible, I think, than just having A and rescue, because then you just install a new rest recovery mechanism on the server, and recover any problems you cause on the devices itself. I'll um, throw OS3 into the mix there as, a, um, as an alternative. So full disclosure, I work on MetaUp data, which is OS3 for, for Yocto. Um, but the advantage there is that rather than having this fixed three-way split between um, the A and the B and the user partition, all of that is in one file system, and then it uses some Chirrut magic uh, and hard links to avoid multiple copies of files. Um, so if the problem for not wanting AB is lack of storage space, um, or this need to do an upfront hard partition, um, then OS3 sort of solves that problem um, and also solves the Delta problem a, a bit later. But, um, but you need to trust your file system. Uh, yes, um, so uh, you, in, in, in all cases, you have to trust the magic that goes on in EMMC um, that does bulk remapping. Uh, in this case, you also have to trust ext4, or your favorite thing. Um, and uh, our suggestion for people who've wanted to not do that is, is to go back to your rollback thing. So you end up with a small recovery partition which will reformat ext4 and grab a new image over the network, and then assuming you trust DXT's hard against power off uh, and corruption, then you could use that. Yeah, that's but a good alternative, yeah. Okay, next one. So, detecting a successful update. Um, ties back into yeah, recovery, obviously, into doing migration. And it's surprisingly difficult to do that well. What we've been doing so far is just to have a system service that starts late in the normal boot and yeah, basically resets the boot counter. That works reasonably well, but there's a class of problems you can't detect with that. For example, you have, um, you need to have to network connection to contact the update server. So the new system, for some reason, doesn't have working network. Maybe the DHCP client is broken or something like that. The system boots normally, 
you mark that as a valid boot and you still can't do a recovery or you can't connect to the system. So uh, yeah, basically the system is a brick. Um, there has been some progress on the system D side where this, uh, I think it's in the last few weeks, it has been merged, um, there's a mechanism for automatic boot assessment. Basically, they added some boot targets which allow ordering such check services into the boot. So you can just add a system data service which checks a specific as aspect of your system, maybe self-test of the application, a network connectivity check, and so on. And you can assemble them as system data services in a target. And only if all those uh, checks were done correctly, the system would get marked as a successful boot. So maybe the system has no network, the user needs to power cycle the system three times and then it switches back. It's still not perfect, but um, so far I don't have any better ideas, so I'd be interested in uh, anyone who has solved that in a better way. That's what I feared, nobody. Um, yeah, any ideas what we should try in that direction? Oh. So, um, so I'm not sure what the exact problem is here. So, because I mean, like in Fuego, we just SSH the board, and if we make a connection, it's up. Uh, so, is the issue that you can't detect that the newly installed software is actually there versus the rescue, or um, that the newly installed software actually works correctly or well enough that we don't need to fall back? Okay. So. Um, Many of our, our customers have very constrained testing resources. So, yeah. If all our software were perfect, you wouldn't need rollback or something like that. So, okay. we need to decide when to roll back. And obviously, a kernel crash during boot is easily handled by not incrementing uh, the boot counter. So, three kernel crashes later, you run the old system again. But there are if the update system itself doesn't work anymore in the new system, or if you can't access the system but still can boot correctly, then you have a running system which you can't use and you can't easily recover from. And so we need ha to have yeah, automated ways to detect that. It will, okay. will be project specific probably. So you're looking for some kind of standard metric for what constitutes, I mean, a, a, a valid boot. Yeah, so, so the obvious thing is you have network access and the updating service daemon runs or something like right. that. Right. But yeah, I was hoping maybe someone else had something You could update it twice and better. then if the second one works, then it, the first one was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't have really a solution, but I just wanted to tell you what we did. So we just ended up having a service waiting until system D is ready then trying to uh, talk to all services which are interesting. So we have a list of interesting services, not interesting services, trying to get from them what, what their status is. And then we open the very bad pit of uh, hardware which we depend on. So we have modems in our hardware and so we try to get out of the modem. Are you working? Do we need to update you? Are you working still? And we still have no solution to, to end this because um, we can and we have no network connectivity, but it's not our fault. And so, and we can't roll back because we are part of a network which updates, and mm -hmm. maybe we are updated, but our uh, master is not updated. So I would be very interested in something, yeah, implementing a sort of quorum also. So 10 are saying it's good, two are saying it's not, it's good enough for us also. And we're trying with this, but we found no good solution for this. But I think this is really needed to decide when to roll back and when not. Uh, 
as a, so we've had this problem building updaters. I think this is um, an area which is always going to be project specific, and my feeling, my goal uh, is this is a point where it would be really good to collaboratively create some API because on one hand there's the updaters and there's a bunch of those and they all have this problem and a bunch of other problems where they need to interact with the rest of the system and but, but, but the API is very narrow it's just it's yes. okay or it's not okay yeah exactly um, and if we could make that that standard, and I think that API is going to have some other stuff in it because you probably need to signal that you've made a rollback so the user user space can recover, and then there's a whole bunch of other places where the update system needs to hook with the rest of the thing. But that would be one part of a, a contract between the update system and the rest of the thing, and then you can do your checks in system D and whatever, and then we want a standard way to poke an updater. Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, what the system D people have uh, implemented there is already 80% of that. So you have one target which contains the checks and another target which uh, confirms the boot as okay or um, to handle a failed boot. Okay. So you can just plug into that with systemd services. Okay. And the, the logic, I think, is enough to, to handle those checks. Oh, the, the boot assessment from systemd was new yeah. to me today, but maybe they've done it already. Yeah. It's, it sounds like it's standardized enough so we, we can just use that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, um, so, so one thing, uh, you know, related specifically to the, the issue of networking modems being down and, you know, multi-component uh, uh, systems, I think there's definitely a, a case for, you know, a higher level orchestration view of this, right? Each individual system has the ability to detect boot, uh, successful boot, and whether it's, you know, the ability to talk to some specific server on the internet or, you know, your clients are up and running, that's one level. But then you're, I think, ultimately in any, in any complex design, you're going to have to have some Le higher level orchestration that can detect failures that are simply not detectable from an individual node in the system. Uh, and I know we've talked to plenty of uh, users that are looking at very large systems, very complex systems, bringing all kinds of uh, different levels of devices together. And ultimately, th that, that's what they're looking at, right? The, the devices themselves can say, yes, I know there's something wrong with me, but that can only go so far until you have to have something that, that's completely outside of the system that says, okay, this portion over here is just not there anymore. And then, you know, at that point, then you might have to send technicians out or whatever if you're talking, you know, <laughs> very large uh, 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 transit systems or things like that. Do we have an, any uh, standard API for that? Or is uh, it project-specific? Yeah, none, none that I've heard of. Everything, it, it, all the discussions I've had about it have been very, very project-specific. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, you know, some of the lower-level technologies they use, you know, the, the JSON and the, the various transport layers and MQTT and that kind of thing, those things are obviously standardized, but uh, it's how the, all the components are put together uh, is going to be, again, very application-specific. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if this is uh, connected, but is it possible to use boot integrity so you know the, a cryptographic hash of what the image should be after it was successful and then verify that? On yeah. At that level, um, I think all those systems we've mentioned already check during installation. And you can combine that with something like uh, DM Verity, like Android does, to detect corruption of the uh, uh, yeah, file system or application data on disk. But in most cases, the problems that actually happen are just bugs in the application and not corruption that happens on the device itself. And yeah. So it's not a failed update, it's a failed no. payload. The it's payload is wrong from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, because the testing wasn't good enough, so the customer didn't catch that problem and it happens in the field, and we still want to have some way back to the old system to, so we can recover the systems in the field. Okay. Um, we uh, often have different kind of faults, and we can uh, detect them, and we report them on our embedded devices, but uh, we, uh, I think we, most of us have a watchdog, uh, that, uh, which is uh, a hardware watchdog, and usually, uh, in our case, uh, we link uh, our application watchdog 
uh, to this hardware watchdog uh, in case we have, uh, uh, if, if the software goes uh, faulty and not uh, the um, uh, environment which is detected as faulty, and then we report it. it. So in this case, we will take, uh, uh, we will reboot the system. Um, so usually when we do a firmware uh, upgrade, we want to know very soon if it is okay or not, but um, by waiting for the watchdog uh, to, to kick off or not, we might get some help in knowing if the system is okay because we already did it. Uh, we have some uh, fail safe, safe, well, some sanity check in our embedded software so we can just use it and through the watchdog. Yeah. That, that's something we've also done with customers to just wait five minutes before the system is, uh, the, or the newly installed system is marked as okay, to just wait if any crash or the, the watchdog at, um, triggers a reboot. So that works well in, in cases where the applications already have some integration with the work, watchdog. Yeah, the, the thing which is interesting is we did the work already because uh, the, the watchdog is already in place for insanity in our software. So. Yeah. Um, what I've also been thinking about is I think there are actually two kind of successful. One is the device is doing its work and so it can run and it can all do all kind of things. And the other is, I can install an update. So basically, these are a bit orthogonal, and we are putting it in the same part, or more or less, here. And I think it might be different to, to, to decide, do I need both, or do I need either? Because if it's, I can install an update, I don't need to fall back on the, on the old system to install a new update to fix things. Um, but, and, and can, but if it, it doesn't run right now, um, I think that's two kind of things that need to be looked at separately because I, I'm not allowed to try to install an update if the update is broken, um, but it might still continue running and do the necessary things in terms of downtime so, so I can keep running the new system. Um, so there might be need to, to separate the two and, and decide what to do um, for either of them. Yeah, um, I think we still have 10 minutes left, probably. Um, so I choose one at random, uh, atomic bootloader updates, or uh, delta at updates probably more interesting. So in, in RAUC, we now have uh, for some months support for CAsync, which is another project by Leonard Pettering to yeah, basically do something like the rsync algorithm over whole fi file systems. So it will only download those things it doesn't have in the old uh, system. It can yeah, reuse parts it already has. So that keeps the download size pretty small if you have network. And that's useful for, yeah, for systems which are connected via cellular data or something like that. But what we currently don't have is some uh, explicit binary delta to the old version, which could be installed in an offline way. So um, I think the OS tree people have that basically under control. Um, for the image update mechanisms, I don't know of a, a finished solution. So maybe someone has built something like that or experience with that. So our use case was pretty much was stayed up there. It's, it's uh, updates over GSM cellular modems. So, uh, and, and that's like, 100,000 devices updated over each own cellular modem, and it's a price tag per megabyte that you send. So Delta update size was like the single target that we had to minimize. Uh, and to solve that, we looked at different algorithms like CAsync. There's also this VCDIF. Uh, it's 
pretty, I don't know if it's a standard, but it's, it's a common format for describing a delta. Uh, it's implemented by Google in OpenVCDIF, and it's implemented by another tool called xdelta, free. I found that the later one was, was pretty much impossible to link with, so I chose the Google version. Uh, and then also there's a different uh, Google project that's embedded in, in Chrome and, and Chromium that's called Cochette. Uh, and it's, it's basically, so that, that's like the three options that we found. Cochette is also, it's falling back to be as if, if it doesn't really have the options to use its own specialized version. So it's Cochette and VC diff and, and C async. And in our case, we actually ended up implementing all three of them in the same update tool. So that we, when we built the update from the old version of our system to the new version, we actually generate all three of them and then choose the best ones. So in, in the usual case, the kernel image is going to use one version and the rule file system is going to use another version and then we bundle that into the same update and send it out. Um, so, and that's, and then of course we also have the option to use a full update uh, if that's what I do on, when developing because I don't want to sit generating like what do I have on target now? It's, I don't remember so I just push the full update. Um, um, how much do you save with those approaches? All well, depends on the update. <laughs> so, but, but actually, so we're working with 20 megabytes of, of root file system size now in, 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 now in, a, in the squash FS image. And I don't know, it's like deltas are from three ki kilobytes, 30 kilobytes to, to several megabytes. And, and uh, yeah, even removing stuff from your image is going to take up space in your delta. So. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and it works fairly well. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. We did our own, you know, AB update system because we were very short of developer resource and time. We just used rsync, and we have an AB system, so we just have an rsync daemon on the server, and we just rsync the B system using the A image as the comparator, which you can do with rsync one of our syncs options, and it works surprisingly well. Yeah. It works well enough that we've never had to go and improve it. It's because um, we have a lot of devices over GSM, and um, the saving, it's very efficient. And it, then that's the rsync batch file mechanism? We just, no, we just, um, no, it's not the rsync batch file mechanism. So th that's something I, I tried. Rsync has a mechanism when when it does a copy operation. Um, it can write basically the delta to a batch file, which can then be applied to the same base again on a different system. So you can use AirSync even uh, offline by tra yeah. transferring those uh, batch files. Yeah, but we've always, in our situation, we're always online. And so we're using the A to compare to the B image and just start using AirSync to, mm. to transfer the differences. And that's really quite efficient. Okay. <coughs> We also have uh, an old board, we, uh, which modem is quite slow. Uh, so our strategy was also something like homemade, but uh, at the file level. So uh, the, the diff is done like which files have changed. Uh, but one of the main problems there is uh, how to implement the removal of files that have been removed uh, after the update. So uh, this is hard to roll back because if you have uh, a problem, uh, you have removed, uh, for instance, an important file uh, that may cause some trouble. Um, but you have uh, non, not a, an AB uh, scheme, but uh, a rescue production. Mm. So that's not very much a problem. In, in the worst case, we just fall back into rescue. OK. So I think I'm almost out of time. I just, w I just wanted to add that when you're running like a Delta update system, you also have the whole new class of problems that you want to be sure that you're updating from the right old version to the new version. And, and that takes like, and, and also the update path becomes critical. So if you're on a two version old file system, then you want to actually do two updates in a row. And maybe you have like this big matrix of updates you might want to fetch from the update. So, so that's an, a whole new class. But CA Sync solves that problem by simply doing the diff online. Do you have, uh, for the other tools, a mechanism to check that you're updating from the correct version? Oh, well, my update bundle ships a checksum of the old version, so and it fails if it's wrong, but 
then, then now I have a problem with block devices, like how much checksum in the block device. So I have to store somewhere in the update how big is the old version also. So that's, yeah, you, you yeah. hit another class it, of problems. It gets complex. Yeah. yeah. Okay, some final comments? Was that interesting for you? Yes? No? <laughs>